I'm Jim Halfpenny, and I welcome you to a gathering of naturalists. The gathering is hosted by Naturalist World, an ecological education company located at the north entrance to Yellowstone National Park. Our company sponsors educational programs and research in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We also host this free lecture series, which highlights the knowledge and expertise of those who live, study, and love the ecosystem. Gathering a Naturalist is a series of lectures provided by experts on topics ranging from archaeology to geology to natural history to history and more, and archived for all to enjoy on our YouTube channel, Gathering a Naturalist. Please join me now for our program, Fry Wolf, the Bioacoustics of the Greater Yellowstone, presented by Jeff Reed. Greetings, everyone. I am peachy keen, uh, not just keen, I am peachy keen to share some never before played wild wolf calls with you today. I'm going to give an overview of a bioacoustics project or the sound of living things in the greater Yellowstone focused on wolf communication. My name is Jeff Reed. I was born and raised in the mountains and valleys of southwest Montana, just north of Yellowstone National Park. My academic career involved linguistics and dead languages, and my professional career was spent working with large software companies such as Google, Apple, and Microsoft. Uh, since returning to my birthplace, I really get renewed by doing conservation, um, not just talking about it, doing it in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem for future generations, uh, including my children. I'm just one of multiple people working on the Cry Wolf Project and I'm thankful to support some really bright people. Here's the team putting out 30 acoustic recorders for a focus study we did in January during a balmy minus 20 to minus 30 degree weather. I wanna share with you an audio clip from a wolf called 907F, uh, who's known by many locals here and one of the longest living and most prolific Yellowstone wolves, who has one functioning eye. When she made this sound, she was all alone by one of the park's acoustic recorders on November 15, 2023 at 5.49 p.m. She was separated from the rest of the pack and appeared to be trying to find them. An earlier elk had just come running by the recorder, perhaps with wolves chasing them, and they sounded like this. <laughs> Do me a favor and please close your eyes and no peeking, just close your eyes and listen. An hour after that, she howled like this for 30 minutes. Okay, you can open your eyes and this is what she said, or at least one way in which it can be written down. And this is 907F, the one-eyed wonder. This is one of the ancient Greek texts I used to study. And for most here watching, it's literally Greek to you. But this is another ancient text from 5,000 years ago by the Jairof culture in an area which is now in modern day Iran. Uh, it uses this geometric script that linguists are still trying to decipher and we don't have any clue what it means yet, uh, but it sure looks like it's trying to say something. This is another ancient language, in this case 907F's four wolf howls written down in what is called a spectrogram. A spectrogram has primarily three basic parts. I'm going to give you a quick primer on how to read a spectrogram because it's been, going to be important later. The y-axis is for pitch or frequency from low pitches up to high pitches. The x-axis is simply time or sound over time. And then the color indicates loudness or amplitude, dark being no sound and increasing shades of orange being louder. 
So you have the y-axis with frequency lower to higher, time on the x-axis, and then amplitude or loudness. Recently, there's been a lot more attention in the press about trying to decipher non-human communication. And here are just two recent articles. The first from The New Yorker, titled Talk to Me, Can Artificial Intelligence Allow Us to Speak to Another Species? Uh, which is talking about the very well-funded in millions of dollars Project SETI with a C, which is focused on sperm whale communication. And another article from The New York Times entitled The Animals Are Talking, What Does It Mean? In one of the papers to come out of Project SETI, some really talented linguists and AI researchers summarized the problem and potential of animal communication in the highlighted sentence. Quote, how do we approach a communication system for which we not only don't understand what is meaningful, but also don't know how to test for what is meaningful? And that's what we're trying to do with the Cry Wolf Project. Our goal is to provide a suite of AI acoustic tools focused on carnivores that enhance conservation by supporting applied ecological research, inspirational education, and practical livestock conflict mitigation. This is a video of the Wapiti Pack in Yellowstone doing what we obtusely call a chorus howl. At the bottom, you'll see a representation of 3D spectrograms from which our AI builds what is called a classification model to help us find and study wolf vocalizations in vast amounts of recordings. <laughs> And here we are, Dan Staler, head of the Wolf Project, amongst other things in Yellowstone, and Kira Cassidy, one of the research associates, in the park putting out as what is called an ARU, or an Autonomous Recording Unit. And here's Jeremy and Taylor helping me get one higher up in a tree. You put the recorder out, you turn it on, and you leave. And this is what they look like. You can think of an ARU like a camera trap that takes pictures, but in this case, it's taking sound. It has microphones, SD cards for storage, batteries, and some electronics. And we can record audio 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, with no breaks. Recording every sound from a common chorus frog to an endangered species to the echolocation of a bat. We have to put them up higher in trees in Yellowstone because of what is captured in this recorder. That grizzly bear stood up on its hind legs delicately opened the recorder lid, dumped the batteries, but decided to leave one so we could hear it, and then left the recorder behind. And it's still intact, being used today. Wolves are loud. Um, they can get up to 100 decibels when they howl, so they can be heard from a long ways away. If you think of standing in front of your car 10 feet away and someone honking the horn, that's about the loudness. In fact, we picked up a chorus howl from Lavar Lamar Valley all the way over in Slough Creek, which was 6.7 kilometers away. But we're also learning that wolves make plenty of quiet howls. And an advantage to air use is that they can pick up those softer vocalizations because they are non-invasively near the animal. If you're recording 24 by 7 on multiple recorders spaced six kilometers apart across the landscape, finding the specific sounds you're looking for is like finding a needle in a haystack. One acoustic recorder creates enough data in a year to put on this small hard drive. And to put that in perspective, in the 1970s, this magnetic tape could hold about an hour of audio. We're storing 8,760 of those cassette tapes times 10 
on a device this size. Thank you, Seagate. Um, you're really helpful. The AI helps us find those needles and we can now do bioacoustics at scale. We based our initial AI software on some of the most famous wolves in Yellowstone, like 6, 21, 42, the Druids, the Mollies, the Lamars. Thanks to the contributions of people like Bob Landis, various researchers and citizen scientists. To create an AI model, you first have to teach it what a wolf sounds like by giving it known wolf vocalizations. And this is Gabe, uh, one of our high school interns annotating known wolf calls that we feed into the AI software. And he's smiling because I caught him listening to his first chorus howl. The AI software uses this supervised data to then generate what is called a classifier or detector. We then use that detector to find wolf vocalizations in recordings that we haven't looked at. And it's really useful. What used to take me 10 hours to manually review, I can do in 10 minutes. And so the return on investment is dramatic. After we had created version one of the AI, we put out a bunch of recorders in the greater Yellowstone this summer or last summer and turned them on, recording 24 by seven. And this is what our AI helped us find for the season of 2023. 937 separate wolf vocalization events, ranging from howls to chorus howls to barks, yelps, whimpers, whines, and moans. Each dot on that chart is a vocal event. The larger the dot, the more the events for that given hour. The y-axis represents the hour of day from zero at the bottom up to 23 at the top or midnight to 11 p.m. The x-axis is date, in this case, six months of data. And you'll notice that empty space in the middle of the day where wolves are not as vocally active. And of course, that's gonna shift a little bit during January and February and the breeding season where they will howl more in the daytime but I haven't seen any research yet proving that that holds true for chorus howls. The wolves vocalized 74% of all of the days that were recorded. If I plot the same data on a 24 hour clock, it looks like this. Noon at the top, midnight at the bottom. And if I overlay the average sunrise and sunset times during the summer, wolves tend to communicate at night. Clearly, clearly they are taught when it's appropriate to speak. Not only can we record the sounds, we can also localize where the wolf howl came from. The yellow stars on this map represent special ARUs that we used in January of 2024. Uh, the red dots are wolf howls that the devices could triangulate because sound travels and reaches each recorder at different times. A similar technology called beamforming allows us to get a bearing on the sound by only using one recorder. It's similar to how your ears and brain can localize the direction from which you hear a bird singing if you walk out in your backyard and you can look towards where you're hearing it. And here's a picture of one of those special ARUs. Some of the questions we're now asking the data include the how, the why, and the so what. Uh, how do wolves hear and vocalize? Um, what are their vocal tracks like in their ear canals and their cochleas? And how does their brain process this information? Why do wolves vocalize and process sound? In other words, what are the functions and meanings of their various sounds? Can we count the number of wolves and identify accents and dialects and in individuals and groups? Can bioacoustics inform population estimates? Can we use ARUs in real-time livestock conflict scenarios? And for me, can we be inspired? So let's listen to some wolves. I'm gonna play never before heard recordings of the Rescue Creek Pack. And here's a photo of them in the spring of 2023 on an elk carcass with the usual suspects hanging around, ravens and a grizzly bear. And this was right before we put out the recorders. 
So let me tee this up for you. What you're seeing on the screen is a 24-hour spectrogram from the rendezvous site of the Rescue Creek Pack. Each row is one hour of sound, and there are 24 rows. The brighter orange indicates the loudness of a sound, and dark indicates silence. If you zoom into a particular sound like the one here, you see more of the writing on the wall, so to speak. And here's what our AI helped us find, a classic wolf chorus howl. So I'll play it, and the line indicates the sound you're hearing at that particular time. So let me take a quick second to briefly explain what each of these lines are here that you heard in that initial howl. They are harmonics. They are not three separate wolves. They're just one wolf. And that's what a harmonic sound looks like on a spectrogram. With the step from the bottommost line to the next being an octave or an increase in that initial frequency. What's interesting is your brain at least perceives or focuses on the fundamental frequency or that lowest line, that bottom line, even though each line going up above that is a higher pitch. So you'll hear that lower pitch and that's what you're focused on in your brain. How these harmonics resonate at different frequencies is one way to think about what musicians call timbre or timbre, or the texture of a sound. By manipulating your vocal tract, you can make some individual harmonics sound louder. Uh, timber is important to interpretation of sounds, at least in humans, as seems evident by the fact that your brain evolved to process timber in a region separate from where it processes frequency. This is what a complete chorus howl looks like on a spectrogram. This chorus howl, the main part over there on the left, lasted about two minutes, but the entire vocal event was three and a half minutes. Chorus howls often begin with a series of one or a few wolves howling, and then another wolf will join in, often at a higher frequency, and then there's this preamble with others joining in, and then all-out mayhem. And then there's a tailing off, followed by you know, random howls, and in this case, a growl at the end. One of the questions we're looking at is, do specific wolves, like an alpha or a female, kick off the chorus howl? Another thing we're hoping we can do with software is use it to count wolves. In the picture, you'll see highlighted six different wolves howling at the same time. But in the spectrogram, what we can learn is that there were seven, one of them being off of the camera. Chorus howls from our recordings averaged about two minutes, but this one went on for 10 minutes. Why? Here's two different chorus howls, one on the left and one on the right. What's visibly different about each of these? What are you seeing that's different? Well, the one on the right is lower in baseline frequency than the one on the left. And if I play the one on the left, what you'll realize is that those are coyotes. Coyotes typically howl at 600 hertz on the low end, and wolves are around 350 hertz on the lower end. So on that spectrogram, you start at zero, and then you'll see 100, 200, 300, 400, all the way up to the top at nine and a half about 9.8 uh, kilohertz or 9,800 hertz. And up there in the top around 4,000 hertz, you're seeing and hearing Vesper and white crown sparrows. We trained the AI to classify coyotes into a separate bucket so that we could still study them, but not when we were really focusing on wolves. One of the things I love about spectrograms is that they can tell stories. It's almost like they have a they're a chapter in a book. So you have two spectrograms here, each one hour long, one on the top and one on the bottom. And what a lot of us remember 
is that in the fall, the Rescue Creek pups went missing. And what you're seeing in the top spectrogram over on the far right circled is uh, the faint and distant chorus howl of a small group of adult Rescue Creek wolves. For the next several days, no one was seeing them and we weren't hearing them in the area. On the bottom in the much brighter chorus howl seven days later, all of the adults and the pups were reunited. And if I zoom in on each chorus howl, you'll see that in the top one, there are only a handful of adults participating, but it's very visible and evident that there are more in the bottom spectrogram. So let's shift from chorus howls to a solo howl. They're really hard to see in a one hour spectrogram, but there it is and our AI could easily find it. And this is what I call a close range howl. I'll play it for you. And this one's unusual because it's very low in fre frequency and it really tails off at the end. I suspect there are a lot more of these howls than the ones we hear when we're standing on the road in Yellowstone. We're typically hearing the loud ones. Uh, an interesting piece of research showed that in a captive facility at least, if a wolf's friend or the alpha was removed from the captive site, the wolf left behind would howl voluntarily and not because of some hormonally driven stimulus because they were testing blood samples. So is this a lonely wolf, so to speak, that we have here on the recording? I don't know. The duration of each howl can vary. This one of a captive wolf is 12 seconds. <laughs> recordings on average they lasted about three to four seconds and sometimes as short as a half a second. One thing that keeps me up late at night is how many repeated howls does it take for a wolf to get to the center of a lollipop? This is a 12 minute long spectrogram of a Rescue Creek wolf repeatedly howling. I don't think we know yet what drives the repetition patterns. Sometimes wolves only give one to two howls and sometimes they can go on for a long time. And you'll notice that these howls bounce around in the range of 340 Hertz in pitch or middle F on your piano keyboard. Other wolves howl up towards five to 600 Hertz and the lowest I've seen during the summer is 250 Hertz. That howl clip of 907F I played for you went on for about 30 minutes and she averaged 320 Hertz, which you can hear it's audibly lower than this wolf you're seeing here. It's become fairly easy for me to pick her out in a crowd now just by listening. And hopefully I can convince Rick McIntyre someday that that's just her Boston dialect. Howls can be modulated and combined with other sounds to perhaps mean different things. This is a video by Bob Landis of the Lamar Canyon Pack beta female in April of 2012 after being chased by the Mollies, whom she's staring at off in the distance. And when I first heard this, I thought it was a coyote. So here's the modulated portion of that howl, uh, the wavy part there you're seeing circled. And we have wolves on recording with a similar modulation and perhaps indicating a similar stressful context. Howls come in all shapes and sizes and perhaps functioning to ID one another in the same way dolphins have signature whistles that they use to identify each other. And here's just a handful of different wolf howls and what they sound like. One researcher suggests 
There are many howls, the happy social howl, the morning howl, the wild deep hunting howl, and the call howl. I'll start with the top left. That's our resident homo lupus and famed animal whisperer, George Buman. What's that? It's a puppy. And you can see that higher frequency that moved up in the y-axis of that spectrogram. And this is one of my favorites from the summer. In addition to comparing personal observations about what different wolf howls might mean, it would be prudent to ask how their auditory and vocal biology actually works and evolved. And that's what I meant earlier when I said we're trying to understand how do wolves vocalize and hear. There isn't a whole lot of research on the vocal tracks of wolves and even less so on their hearing apparatus. And so let me give you three examples of fundamental research that could help us understand wolf communication better. So read this sentence to yourself out loud. I made her duck. Even though there's no spaces in there, it's easy for an English spe speaker to see what it means. Now, what does the sentence actually mean? Does it mean I made her duck for dinner? Or does it mean I made her duck because I threw a ball at her? Only the context is going to tell you what it means, even though it's the same words. So here are six different spectrograms of me saying, I made her duck. And if you look closely, you'll notice that they don't look alike, even though they are the same words. So I'm going to play them starting in the top left. I made, I her, made duck. her duck. I, I made, made her duck. duck. I made, I made her, her duck. duck. You get the picture. I made her, I made duck. her duck. I made her duck. I made her duck. I made her duck. I made her duck. I can change the meaning of my communication not just by changing the words, but changing where I focus the loudness or amplitude of sounds. Uh, we call this emphasis, and we do it voluntarily to change what we want to say. So do wolves care about changes in amplitude like we do? Do they even detect it in their brain? Well, to understand that, it would be useful to have a map of the auditory pathways in their nervous system. And don't, you know, we're not gonna wire up a wild wolf anytime soon, but there might be things we can learn from my obliging border collie, for example. So here's another fundamental question, and I got to get a prop real quickly to show you. Sorry that I didn't have that ready. Uh, this picture shows the shape of, or how the shape of your individual mouth can impact how you sound. I'll be simplistic. You can think of your mouth as a tube. And when the length of that tube matches a particular frequency range, the energy in the sound gets amplified. So I can demonstrate that with a tuning fork. And this is a 340 hertz or middle F tuning fork, um, the frequency of a common wolf howl. So if I take that tuning fork and I hold it up to a tube, 
that's the length of the resonating frequency of that tuning fork, what you'll notice is that it resonates louder at that frequency. So you can modify that tube with the position of your tongue and the position of your lips. And that's how we create vowels in human languages. So I want us to do an experiment and we're gonna howl, okay? I'm not gonna give you time to practice and we're just gonna howl. One, two, three. Ooh. Okay? Some of you probably used a vowel like ah, is in father. Ah. Some of you might have used oo or in boot like I did, or even o, o. Different vowel sounds are made by changing the position of your tongue and the opening size at your lips. The vowel you choose, in other words, how you shape your mouth and tongue, and the pitch you use determine which harmonics resonate the loudest. Now try the same howl using E as in beat. E. Okay? What did you hear? You heard a slightly higher pitch, and that's because of how you shaped your mouth. Uh, when you're watching wolves howl, pay attention to their lips, their head placement, and the angle of their head. Now, do wolves have vowels? Um, well, to know that, we want to use micro CT scans of their cochlea's hair cells to see if they can even differentiate vowels and consonants like humans do. Another how question is their body size. For many species, including carnivores, as body size increases, frequency and pitch decreases. In other words, larger animals often have lower voices, and this is true for some birds. A team of folks are studying how the size and shape of vocal tracts in wolves and their ears may determine how a listening wolf might know the speaker's relative body size or even gender, hormonal condition, and even attractiveness. And can we use, for example, a lower frequency howl played through a loudspeaker to deter wolves from livestock conflict scenarios? So let's get back to our 24 hour day. Here's another sound we found. What do you think this sound is later in the day? It looks like a chorus howl at a distance and I'll play it. It's an airplane. Airplanes happen to look like a chorus howl on a spectrogram. And we had to train these types of sounds out of the AI to make it better. Here are all of the commercial airplanes that flew over during that 24 hour period. There's a lot more human made sound than we think. And here in red are the four chorus howls for that day. Now, if we skip past a bunch of sounds, what do you think is going on in this sound pattern that's circled in yellow? It's wind. And if you recall that each of these spectrogram rows is one hour, this would put you at about noon when the northern range winds in this area very predictably start to kick in and wolves aren't kicking in vocally as much. Here's another type of wolf vocalization we recorded on this day. These types of sessions went on and on and on for the next six hours. Here's another one. Mm -hmm. 
And another one. I'd call that a moan. And another barks. <laughs> Wolves bark in stressful contexts. They come in different forms, such as woofs and disturb disturbance barks, which are shorter in duration and lower in pitch, and agonistic barks, which are longer in duration and have more harmonics. Agonistic barks are often emitted by the dominant individual and often show dominance displays like a tail held high. And that's probably what's going on in this recording. Disturbance barks are only emitted in conflict scenarios towards other packs, to humans, or cougars, or bears. Here's another sound. It sounds very similar to our dog standing at the door wanting to get out. And another. Uh, it's often called a woa. Vicente Paleosis, I think, coined that term. And this is a sound wolves make when they move their mouths open and shut and are in close contact with other pack mates. And you'll often see this in a chorus howl. It appears to function as some type of social bonding vocalization. And of course, let's end with an example of a howl series. This is the intro to the final, final chorus howl from that 24 hour period. Now, is this a sentence with different meaningful words in it, or is it simply the same word repeated multiple times? We don't know. Uh, but one thing, for me at least, is that one of the most recognized sounds of the wild, a wolf howl, has a lot left to teach me. So this is the closing paragraph, the Rescue Creek Pack story, from our recorder at their rendezvous site. This spectrogram is 18 minutes of seven different chorus howls between two different groups of the Rescue Creek pack. The louder and brighter ones include the pups. The fainter and distant ones are from a smaller group of Rescue Creek wolves further away from the rendezvous site. And I never saw a recording like this all summer. August 26th, the day of this spectrogram was the day the Rescue Creek Pack left their summer rendezvous site based on the caller data. And what I ponder, or at least I hypothesize, took place in this recording is that the distant group of adults are calling towards the pup pack group. Each group chorus howls back and forth and back and forth until finally the pups break camp and leave their summer home. So all of our data is available to the public and to researchers. You can go to the CryWolf webpage and access the data. You can modify search terms um, and download the actual wolf recording of interest to your computer. And if you're a researcher, you can reach out to Dan Staler 
uh, to access the entire raw data set for download, as well as our AI algorithm to use on your own recordings. You can also visit the Languages of Life website for an overview of different types of equipment and software if you're interested in recording your own wild soundscapes. And it's really easy to do and it's, it's, it's a great place to start just in your backyard. And then you can travel around and you know record everywhere. Uh, a common thing I use that's really simple, I'm not trying to produce movies here, but a really good Sennheiser MKE 600 mic that's only $300 and then a Nikon, I think this is a P1000 and it zooms way out and the mic picks up audio at a long distance and you can get both context of the vocalization event and you can get good recordings from it as well. And there's more information on different devices on that site. So I would be remiss if I didn't say something about conservation. And depending upon the crowd, uh, I sometimes get the following question. So what? So what? What good is this effort for humans in general? Or for example, a rancher who is providing habitat for wildlife, but has to deal with the occasional, but nonetheless costly predation of livestock by predators. So my answer, at least my personal answer to that question starts with asking us to be honest with one another based on the data. Humans are now everywhere. The graphic on the left shows that we are animal food sources and pets combined to make up 94% of the total combined weight of all animals on Earth. Only 6% of the world's biomass, excluding insects and plants, are wildlife. And to put that in even more perspective, the total combined weight of our domestic dogs weigh roughly the same as all other wildlife. And furthermore, if I break down that wildlife number, 10% of all wild land animals, excluding rats, are made up of one species, white-tailed deer. And they've recovered from near extinction, thankfully, in large part due to the hunting community, but they're still not back to their pre-colonial days. And they make up 10% of all wild land animals. That's what many people consider to be wildlife a white-tailed deer, and I suppose rats if you're from New York City. Is that the new West we want as people flood here to where we live, subdivide the land, and as commercial recreational companies lobby for more trails and roads when the wildlife are simply trying to maintain their 6% status? I'm a fair chase, old school Boone and Crockett hunter, Ask us, we want biodiverse landscapes that represent the way it used to be. Not some manicured, fenced in, hand fed, new west wildlife landscape. Now, of course, that's my opinion, but back to the point. Before we go whining about predators on the landscape, what is the data telling us? Conflict is inevitable. It's not an option. Why would we expect otherwise? We should definitely care about predation events. We should care about ranchers and the open space that they create and the habitat they create. But conflict is going to happen with people. Unless, of course, you know, I suppose one solution is to kill all wildlife, but that would fly in the face of public sentiment and the love for wildlife that's driving people to the West. So let's just get to work as conservationists and philanthropists. Lethal tools are not the only solution to reducing conflict. There are many non-lethal tools for coexistence. Range riding, flagery, electric fencing, guard dogs, and loud sounds. Um, but we found that a common issue is that predators often get habituated 
to these various tactics. So what we're asking in the Cry Wolf Project is, can we use the language of the predators themselves to deter them from conflict scenarios? This is a picture of the device we're building to test playbacks of large-bodied wolf howls to see if it will deter them from encroaching on livestock conflict hotspots. And you know, this is what one of these devices look like. It's a camera trap, an audio recorder, and it's a playback device. Let me play for you a recording of 907F and another gray howling at a rival wolf. Now I'll play the exact same recording, but downshift it by 30 hertz to convey a larger bodied sized wolf. We've just started collaborating with Mark Coates. Um, we're not even in the batter's box yet, but he's a rancher and he's testing how wolf howls can deter other wolves. He has a book out, which I think you'd find fascinating, regardless if you're a rancher or not. And I have to chuckle a little bit here um, because we just got to get the friends of Ray Dalio, who graciously funded Project SETI, or perhaps Warren Buffett himself, to support us working class Westerners to help the ranchers with these devices and try to keep this place wild for future generations. Who remembers this album by Roger and Katie Payne in 1970? Uh, this record changed the course of whale conservation and when NASA launched their golden record and when NASA launched their golden record aboard the Voyager spacecraft in 1977, which is out there somewhere beyond the solar system, one of the songs was included on that 12 inch gold plated disc along with uh, music from Bach, Mozart and Louis Armstrong. Then in 1979, an extract from that album was sent to all National Geographic's 10.5 million subscribers. This made it the largest single pressing in recording history, a record it holds to this day. What many do not know is that in 1971, the New York Times published an article in a review of an album by Columbia Records titled the Language and Music of Wolves, narrated by Robert Redford and with wolf recordings by John and Mary Taburge, who many of us know around here and seen them doing uh, bioacoustics research here in Yellowstone. The record was a hit. But what's different between 1971 and today? Well, wolves are back in Yellowstone. So we started a fictional band called Five-Toed Wolf and their debut album, including some of the sounds you heard today in honor of that. Huge conservation success. You can check out the public outreach site and learn more about how we've used the words from some of the most famous wolves of Yellowstone to train an AI model that is helping us study and find the wolves of today and even those yet not born. Here's just one more wild sound you can download from the Five Toed Wolf website. And hopefully we'll have a vinyl pressing of that and the other sounds soon. That's just a simple pedal distortion version of that same real wolf call I played for you. It's for you rockers out there and we titled it When the Howl is Over, a spin on When the Music is Over by the Doors. And that's two things we hope never happen. Wolf howls are not music. Equally, I don't think at least, 
they talk like us humans. I think both assumptions are a disservice to the animals themselves. But I do think we can get better at speaking wolfish. All we have to do is look to the wisdom of ancestors. There are many examples of indigenous cultures like the Tukadika or sheep eaters who understood animal communication much better than we do. As is evident from this quote from a trapper who encountered them not far from here where I live in the 1800s. Quote, the sheep eaters are complete masters of what is called the Kabbalistic language of birds and beasts and can imitate to the utmost perfection the sounds of birds, the howling of wolves, and the neighing of horses, by which means they can approach by day and night all passers-by. And by the way, don't go howling in Yellowstone or you might end up in the brink like that other guy who just did recently. Uh, and that's for good reason. Let's give this last stronghold of the Old West wildlife a break from us humans as much as we can. So thank you for your time and listening. I need to thank Dan Staler, Kira Casti, Taylor Raby, Jeremy Sunderaj, and Joanna Lambert for their technical advice. And a big thank you to our current partners, both in the field and financial and academic, including all of the business members of the Wild Liv Livelihoods Business Coalition, who are making the case to Montana's government officials that wolves, grizzly bears, and other carnivores are in the public trust and contribute significantly to our local economy north of Yellowstone Park. I've included links to the various websites here that I mentioned, as well as my email address if you want to reach out. So thank you, and uh, we'll take questions. One of the hardest things to train out of the AI are insects. They sound like wolves to the spectrogram. So there's an insect on there as well. Uh, I was wondering if you are able to distinguish individuals by their, you know, individualistically distinct howls. Yeah. And the same thing with packs. Yeah. And I talked about that, and um, I can show you on the screen. The, the only papers I've seen, there's like three or four papers that talk about the one way that humans can distinguish wolves yeah. from each other, not necessarily the wolves, is the ending frequency of the howl. So it's at the end of the howl, what frequency do they end at? What pitch do they end at? And that's a very easy way to see repetitive patterns of a particular wolf. Now, okay. We don't know if that's how wolves do it. Um, and then in pack signatures, I've seen uh, in chorus howls, um, I've seen wolves outside of the park in packs who, you know, remember how I mentioned uh, a chorus howl will often start with a lone wolf howling and then it'll pick up and crescendo and then off. Uh, Outside of the park, in this one particular pack, I noticed that they didn't do many ending howls. They would just stop and then be done. Um, so that's a way to signature them. We, we don't know what wolves are doing. Um, there's an there's a old theory called the Bogesh theory, um, which is that if... It's, it's like coyotes, right? When you hear them out your back door, you're like, oh, there's 18 coyotes out my back door, and there's two, right, or three. And it's there could be a selective advantage for them to sound like there's more of them, and at what point can you just not distinguish anymore how many there are? So that's another nuance to that question of a, a signature, um, and that's kind of debated in the literature. Um, at what point, you know, are you trying to sound like you're more wolves or the big bad wolf or something like that? That's another key. Um, so there are signatures there. There's I could get into a lot of details on some AI uh, algorithms that are trying to tease apart what is the meaningful unit of a howl or what are the possible meaning units of a howl. And then the only way you could really test that is with playbacks. Like you would go play back 
a wolf howl and modify it and see if they behave accordingly. And you would, you know, likely do that in a captive mm -hmm. scenario. But who knows what's going on in the heads of a captive wolf? Um, you could do it in in private land scenarios as well. So yeah, that's the semi short answer. Did that help? And if it brings up more questions, just to ask. So the ending frequency for individual wolves is a key to listen to. And then you saw all the variances. Um, no one's really done a detailed study saying, um, we call it a disconnected howl where they drop really fast in the frequency. Do they do that? Now, when I was out watching, several of us were watching, remind me, Jeremy and Kira, I think it's 1090 and uh, 1339. They were on both sides of the road and they were howling. And I was trying to record, and if you take one thing away from this talk, it's like, shut up when you're out in the field. Um, when I went back and looked at this recording event, which lasted a good hour at least, it was easy for me to see the differences between those two, three wolves in this case. And there was a third wolf, a, a male that was with the female who wouldn't cross the road, and he had a higher pitch, a little more modulated, and so was that because it was a meaningful howl saying something like, I don't want to cross the road, you guys come here? Or was that just the way that wolf talked? A lot of work to be done. That's what I love about it is there's lots of fun things to still learn. Um, and paying attention to the wolves that are howling, recording them, it's hard in the field sometimes, but when you get back and I can crank up the volume, um, I can amplify what you're getting on a recorder and you can start hearing it better. Another question is, do you, do you think the AI uh, programming has the potential to get to the point where the AI will select out either individuals or packs? Oh know? yeah, the AI can easily distinguish between different wolves. Um, what you would need at that point would be knowing which wolf that is. So, and, the other, and the other thing is consistency over time. I mean, that, yeah. like you said, could just be say, doing something in <laughs> yeah. context that would sound like another wolf yeah. in another context. Yeah, there's two things we're interested I'm more interested in the meaning and the function, mm -hmm. and that's going to be a lot harder to get to. Now, let's be honest. Like, a bark is not a howl, and a bark functions differently than a howl. So there are two different, quote-unquote, words. Mm -hmm. um, the question being asked is, do howls have morphemes in it? Like, you can take the word walk and add ing, walking, I walked, I'm walk, right? So you can add things to that one word and still have a general meaning, but you can enhance it in a slight way by adding other functional meanings to it. Uh, the example I give people is, if you're walking down the street and someone's across the street from you, and you say the word, hey, and you're trying to get their attention. That's kind of what people think, talk about wolf howls as, is like, I'm trying to get someone's attention. But if I say, if, if someone's walking across the street and they're keying my car, and I say, hey, versus Kira's walking down the street and I say, hey, right? I'm trying, two different meanings there going on, same sound, um, and so are there things in those howls that could have slightly different meanings? A chorus howl is a good example. Are there interpack and intrapack chorus howls? Well, if there are, right, you wouldn't want to make the mistake of saying, come here. You're doing something different by uh, interpack chorus howling. Because you're obviously not saying, let's get together for a beer. Um, the question is, is that in the sound? Is it in the signature of the sound? Mm -hmm. Are those meanings uh, conveyed? And you'd, what you'd want to get is a lot of chorus howls, and then start using the software to tease out where the differences are, and then use human observation to come to some conclusions. Mm -hmm. the, the greatest thing we're doing is building a library of, of data coupled with observations mm -hmm. that over time researchers and individuals can start sorting through and seeing patterns. Do we have any information <coughs> coming from wolves 
that I've been raised away from other wolves, is there any worthwhile information? I'm trying to understand what part of this might be instinctive, what part might be learned. Yeah, um, not that I'm aware, I mean, there's lots of people who study captive wolves, uh, study wild wolves. Um, we're still trying to figure out wild wolves, and I think they're still trying to fill up, figure out captive wolves. There's a lot of interest in using captive wolves to figure out some of these things. Uh, what did you say at the end there, though? I was going to comment on that. What part is instinctive and what part is learned? I'm really interested in that because um, pups, you know, are blind and deaf, you know, for a little bit, and then they immediately are howling. So there's some innateness to that. Uh, with with human speakers, uh, the first vowel you make, infants make across all cultures and language groups is usually ah, uh, because it's easy to make. It's an easy sound to make, and then a labial like a ba or a pa, and so mothers are consistently fooled into thinking that their baby is talking to them when they're making the easiest sound, and then they're reinforced, right, to keep making that sound. So I'm interested in if wolf pups make a sound that's natural to them, and then they start learning from that uh, adult how to make a more sophisticated wolf howl. And there's the pups from this summer, I've got some where it's just the pups doing a chorus howl. I'm pretty confident it's just the pups doing a chorus howl. And it's like, holy crap, like you don't know what you're doing. Like, but you're trying, right? And so how fast do they learn that uh, through um, just listening? If you could get a young, be watching a young wolf through time. Yeah. So observation and sound, you can actually watch the, that progress. That would be really tough. Yeah. But it, as you get, get well, one way to do that, if someone would give me money instead of sending it to Harvard and Project <laughs> SETI, is to put a collar, to put a recorder on a collar. Mm. Yes. And that takes some, um, you know, good know-how to do it. But that would be the least invasive way to get a long span of time on a wolf. I'd love to do that on a den. Um, so a mother in a den getting all the recordings from the pups from birth to when they leave. Um, and then that data set could be you know, valuable for that. I wonder if wolves change their hounds when they switch packs. Yeah, that's one thing Rick asked me. Rick, you know normally ignores me, but he asked me that question, if, if a dispersing wolf takes over, let's say, the dominance of another pack, does that dialect get, he really wants to think that they're Boston dialects of wolves, does that dialect get picked up in the new pack? Mm -hmm. And that would take data gathering, right? It would be a tough one because you'd have to know that, that dispersing wolf's history of sound in the other pack and then when it came to the new one, and then you'd want to study which other wolves picked that up. Um, but again, that's the point of having 80 years of life, is to have fun. So if different packs have different dialect, let's say, so to that extent, that's a learned behavior, or learned sounds. Most likely dialects would be learned in an animal species, um, whether the baseline sound they're making is learned is a different question. But yeah, I would say at a dialect level, it's learned um, in the same way it's learned in humans. I mean, language is learned in humans, but the sounds you make aren't necessarily learned. Now, you learn some sounds, like if you try to take, take some tone sounds in, in Cantonese, I'll bet you no one in this room could imitate mm -hmm. some of the tones because mm -hmm. it is so hard to get your muscles mm -hmm. to produce mm -hmm. that. Um, so there's there's definitely learning in the sounds, but there are some just baseline sounds like vowels, especially in certain consonants that are universal or tend to be universally used. How does a dialect show up in a spectrograph? You would com you would take a a simple way would be to take either an individual or a group, and a bunch of recordings from those groups, and then the same from different individuals and groups.
but where it shows up in the spectrograph is difficult because you have to differentiate between is that a meaningful difference or is it just a variance of the sound without contributing meaning? I think of it like this. If a southerner is speaking and says the same sentence as me, it's not a whole lot of difference in meaning, but there is cultural meaning, right? The way we interpret that person, our biases we put on that person. So there's ways we'll respond to that communication that have meaning, but it's, it's different, right, than adding ing to walk. And so that's why I read that quote from that paper. It's like, how do you test for what is meaningful versus just a variance that could be because of learning, because I spent all my life with this particular path. So do you really need to un understand what the wolves are saying before you use that to decrease the conflicts between the cattle and the wolves? I mean, you don't want to feel something off. You might be saying, hey, come on down for, for dinner. Yeah, this is the ethical debate, right? Yeah. There's lots of ethics in this. I just was meeting with FWP today on the topic. There's a couple ethics here. Is like If you can localize sounds, I could localize a bull elk bugling, and I did it this year, and I got a text, and it gave me a push pin. That's where the bull elk's bugling. And I can even analyze that and go, that's a nice bull elk. I don't think any hunter in the room, me included, wants that, right? But there's nothing in state statute right now that prevents me from doing that. I can't do it with camera images, but I can do it with sound. That's one whole ethical debate. And then the other is, lots of people howl to draw in wolves to shoot them, right? I'm just saying, okay, set that topic aside. I'm saying, can you howl in a way to push them away? And I think that has conservation value. The question is, are there those howls? Um, I think, a priori, it's a good bet that there are. Um, otherwise, they would all run together when they heard competing wolves howling, if that was the default. Optionally, it could just be that they're signaturing each other and they know that this isn't one of our wolves. So that could be non-meaningful, but it could be ID specific. So we don't know if there's an aggressive howl. Uh, though, if you ever try it you know, at home, in the shower, and you howl, and you really force your your throat and your head back, you'll start to get raspiness. The, the valve will break down. And you get that in wolf vocalizations. Um, and I'm interested to see, like observation, people observing that, to see if they see that they're really stretching their throat and you get that raspiness. So you can reproduce that easily. Whether you're trying to communicate meaning with that is a different thing. The part where you're talking about trying to lower the frequency to make a to give the impression of a large bull. And what about um, like doubling or tripling the number of wolves in a pack? If that would also drive it's going to be a combination of both. Um, I would be afraid of playing a chorus howl at a pack that you were trying to deter from a livestock scenario. I wouldn't like lead with that. But if you had a dispersing wolf that was a problem wolf around a livestock area, then I would really focus on a lower pitched howl first and test if that pushes them away. I wouldn't just randomly create a wolf howl because you could be making an I'm a sexy broad wolf howl. <laughs> and here comes the wolf, right? And it's going to stay around for a long time. Yeah, it's a good, really good question. Um, so be smart about how you're going to try to implement that. That's the cool thing about playbacks, is you can test them. Right? You can text, test these in captive scenarios or on private land that doesn't mind wolves being around and see what the behavior is. Um, it would be really nice, especially if the wolves were collared, because you really want to know what their movement response is to a howl. If they got up and took off, 
bingo, I just made a million bucks um, with this howl. People might be curious about the story behind the five tour rule. Yeah, you're going to hear it for the first time. Well, a couple of you heard it. Um, the Five Toed Wolf, uh, when I had this idea, let's do an album in honor of John and Mary and, and just what's happened. I typed into ChatGPT, the, the image version of ChatGPT, Dolly. I said, create a album cover of a wolf print with a waveform, spectrogram going through it. Fit out that, right? The, the graphic there. And I set it aside, I said, oh, that's cool. And I set it aside, and a couple weeks later, I opened it up, and I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, that's still cool. And I'm like, wait a second, there are five toes. <laughs> and then I thought, well, wait, wolves well, technically have top five toes on the front. And so I thought, this is a great example of artificial intelligence kind of getting it right and kind of getting it wrong. So it hit, and then I just called it Five Toed Wolf. And that's that's the secret Jim Halfpenny naturalist meeting only version. <laughs> five Toed Wolf. And yeah, it's just fivetoedwolf.com. We're trying to decide, you know, whether we use this for fundraising, like you could have famous people sign it, um, and they could raise money for the YF Project and Rocky Mountain Wolf Project. Um, but for now, you can just go to the website and download the album and put it on your How You Go to Sleep recording. Uh, there are some really cool, cool sounds in there. And, and then the trick is, can you decipher the song titles I made for them? Because they're cryptic, but there is meaning in there. So what, you know, what do you know about this particular song title? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.